Nick, LFM taking us to that Sky Temple. Again, this is the best battleground for LFM. Right above Infernal Shrines, where they are already able to get that win. As you said, Phoenix, where does that fall into this draft? Is it let through? Does No Tomorrow pick it up? And even if so, is that enough for them? Uh, I'm going to say it's a nice start, but they've been sticking to this offensive Genji Garrosh rotation back to back on first map. I just talked about it, made sense. Second map, higher risk, doesn't pay out for them. To me, that shows that a little bit of the mentality, at least I'm assuming here, that No Tomorrow goes, we have to play aggressive this weekend. That's when we look our best. And I don't know if that's now the moment where they're willing to kind of take that step, step back. I'm not saying Phoenix can't play to that aggressive play style. I think he can. But let's be real here. He is kind of new enough to where, you know, if you have that miscommunication whatsoever with the initiations, things could look really silly pretty quickly. Well, the Genji was obviously a high priority for No Tomorrow, but I wonder, because we've seen so much Genji on the side of LFM in the form of Draded comes in with that gray main Genji style that he's like to play. Obviously, Phoenix being let through for him, he's more than comfortable playing that. So I wonder if Phoenix does indeed go over to No Tomorrow, all of a sudden, do we potentially get that Genji out from LFM, which has been relatively successful in the individual hands. But as we've seen so far, Phoenix has done a pretty good job countering that style. So I kind of wonder where we're going to get the change up here. Again, a lot of it does rely strictly on the Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix has done pretty well so far just in general, at least in North America. He lost one game in the first series, won his other two, and he's won both games, I believe, in this series as well, right? Uh, no, LFM did lose just the first lost. one. Yeah, okay. yeah. It, so was, then, it was a good performance in the game number one, just didn't add up to the rest of the team's yeah, success. That'll be interesting here as he's holding near that 50% win rate. Always been in that first pick slot, though. There's the Maya. I smell a Medivh. Is the Medivh versus Phoenix trade-off a thing? No. Here comes the Phoenix. Hello. What I'm if a they hit you with a first pick Genji? Analysis. I would have how, been how? very sad. <laughs> I would have been snap. What? OK, so what is the response for LFM? Garrosh Genji is a rotation that you can get away with. The same, you know, kind of manner that we saw on the Sky Temple out of No Tomorrow, or excuse me, Towers of Doom on No Tomorrow. I don't know if I want to see it, though. Uh, not only because I don't know if I want to see a Genji, but to be honest with you, I don't feel like the Garrosh needs to be committed to this high up. You know, we've seen a lot of Tyrael from the side of Figgy. If it's that's something true. they want to wait on, you know, that's kind of the fallback option. Garrosh obviously has grown to prominence so much that it's almost hard to ignore him. We'll see if they can get that. But no, tomorrow, if they get a Garrosh Phoenix, you know, that could be pretty terrifying. You kind of got to wonder, does this Hanzo come into play here? Tyrael, I think, obviously can help if you do need to get around that boss and get the fight. But where does Hanzo come into play? Is no tomorrow willing and able to run that. This is our first look at Phoenix for no tomorrow. So some questions to be answered here. I definitely would like to see that Hanzo commitment if they don't go with that kind of Genji all in. Malfurion Hanzo is going to be the rotation they go with. I feel like this is very good start for LFM. I didn't expect to see the Malfurion that high up for them, but where in the last game had a pretty big impact. Hanzo, though, so that is something to consider, right? We've seen a little bit of a change up for Hanzo. In Sky Temple, you think about, all right, the objective, there's not always necessarily the right amount of structures, not enough terrain to kind of bounce that scatter arrow off. And when we've seen Garrosh get picked up in the recent past, it's been that redemption at level one for the cooldown on your auto attacks, the explosive arrow for that single target damage. And then level seven, you go the sharpen to make sure you get the armor reduction onto that onto that Garrosh, to take away some of that armor. And then Hanzo becomes poke central there onto that. So it's very hard for Garrosh to just kind of casually step into that style. So I wonder if we'll even see that. We do get a Dahaka, and it's going to be paired with an ETC here. So no tomorrow, not going to commit to that route. A lot slower when it comes to how they want to play this, not only because they have the global for that kind of macro, the control uh, over the later stages of how this map is likely going to function, they even can commit to a doubles, you know, kind of all in if they would like. But ETC mixed with the Dahaka and the Phoenix, that is very, you know, you can pick any backliners. I feel like beyond this point, any support really for that manner. And you go, we've got a pretty well-rounded composition that doesn't have to get that all in initiation and team fight. That being said, LFM, they're also sitting in a position where that's kind of fine. But it's not that all in play style we saw from No Tomorrow in games one and in game two. I really wonder. Tychus and Li Ming are always going to come to mind when we talk about T. I mean, you have to. Both of them do well against ETC, but with the Hanzo there, will we get the Li Ming to kind of get that blow up onto that single target? You also have the Wave of Force to interrupt any potential mosh pits. 
Tychus does the same thing with the grenade. So, you know, it's I'm kind of curious to see what route LFM is going to go down here and whether the Tyrael even maybe gets banned out here by No Tomorrow. Yeah, if they do end up going one or the other with the Tychus versus Li Ming, I would like to see Tychus in this situation just because Hanzo Li Ming is double poke so much so that, like, when it comes to needing to confirm a kill, a lot of the times I feel like it's going to put too much pressure on those front lines, whereas Tychus, more consistent DPS, even some sieging capabilities, makes you a bit more kind of diverse in how you can approach things. Just the warrior pickup in particular is going to be very interesting for me for LFM. Tyrael obviously kind of at the forefront. Garrosh is going to be available. No Tomorrow recognizes that Li Ming is a potential threat on the side of T. Maybe willing to commit to say, hey, we'll give up the Tychus. I think the Tychus is a little bit easier for us to play into. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. Yeah, but uh, actually that very much is saying that No Tomorrow prefers to play into the Tychus. And why? What are what what is what is the weakness of Tychus here? I feel like I've got to be missing something because that is a pretty curious ban. Let's be real here. We've seen Li Ming barely picked, let alone be worthy of a ban. And yes, again, the context here for the choke on one person's hero pool. But why is Tychus that stand out and worth that kind of contribution? I'm trying to think if there's, I mean, obviously we saw the Jaina last game. I don't think Jaina on this battleground works particularly well. Taika seems like that hero, but I'm trying to think if there's anything else we might see out of T. There's been a few games of Cassia, but into this style, you have to compromise your positioning against a Phoenix. You have to deal with that, and you don't necessarily get the maximum amount of value, especially, again, it kind of falls down to that poke value. We get a Genji, which means T might be moving over to that Hanzo, which is... That's interesting to me. Go ahead and hit me with it. Give me every ounce of the j how thought process right now. What is your immediate concern? Obviously, other than we've got T moving over to a different hero, which already in the fact that he's been limited in his hero pool, I feel like is a bold move, and especially one with as much weight on his shoulder that Hanzo has to carry within every composition. The synergy required behind double Shimada is typically pretty high. Yes. When we say pretty high, we mean probably amongst the top 5% of compositions that are relevant within the current meta. And think about now the composition that he's going into. There's a Gray Mane on the backside of Phoenix. And if you think about effective health pool with the shields, Phoenix is incredibly high with that. Gray Mane, really high. Trades very well into a Genji when he gets into that back line. If Gray Mane doesn't have to engage into the enemy team and the enemy team kind of comes into him, that is a welcome trade there for the Greyman. He can also stay into human form if he needs to, so there's a lot to consider. Now for LFM. It's gotta be Tyrael now. It's gotta be, right? It legitimately feels like it has to be forced all the way down into that. If you don't go with that, I mean, if this was, you know, pre-Stukov release, I maybe would argue for an Arthas or something alike, but within a new Barak, Jao. I'm no Phoenix master. You know, I've gotten to dabble. I've played a couple Hero League games. I've looked into, we've studied, we've looked at it. Uh, he has a lot of magic damage, but he doesn't like have to have a lot of magic damage. And Greymane can have a lot of magic damage, but he doesn't like have to have a lot of magic damage. So in a new Barak solo warrior last pick, after everything like that we just saw with the double DPS having the option to transition into more auto attack, I'm just scared, you know? That's all I'm trying to say. I'm just, you know, what is... If it works, Burrow Charge into an Impale, into a Jet Propulsion, into a Dragon Arrow, ultimate wombo combo against a Stukov that lacks a Cleanse, and if he's a primary target, maybe you get the initial blow up. The problem that those compositions run into is, what happens if you don't get that initial blow up? There's you, not a lot you else. You don't really make much happen past that. A lot of fireworks and then, you know, you <laughs> hit the dud and the train stops quickly. And it's something that we've seen from teams. So we'll see if they can pull it off here. It doesn't necessarily mean they have to play that style, but let's see if they can make it happen. Either way, LFM got to feel comfortable as uh, we are, again, sitting on their favorite battleground of Sky Temple, even with the commitment there into the Anubarak. I'm trying to figure out, is there any major cocoon, you know, target that we're looking for to be able to see here? I mean, Phoenix is a decent cocoon target, but again, doesn't scream out too much. Also, you know, in the world of cocoon removal, Phoenix is probably one of the better ones that we have, purely based on auto attack damage is pretty high. Having the option to use the plasma cutter on it. Granted, plasma cutter ticks aren't fast and that great, but it's still multiple and it's a resource you don't feel too bad for burning. 
if you're Phoenix trying to burn it down. Prioritizing the global uh, to get vision over eye. See how that rotation to bottom goes. Sometimes if you end up losing one hero here, all of a sudden you find yourself behind just because of early game rotations. And they end up giving up the eye anyways. They're going to keep Tahaka and Blaze in that top lane. See how the priority goes. A lot of teams do try and make their way over Nubarak. That's that's a lot of damage it's, that was eaten there. Yeah, it's the second time that's happened already uh, that we've seen that kind of trade into Figgy. And, I mean, let's be real here. From be the moment we saw it locked in, that's going to be what I keep my eyes on, at least a majority of this game, is how impactful is Figgy really on that Anubarak? And I feel, when I say that, not so much with the, uh, can he hit the skill shots and anything? Can he hit the Burl Charge? Because we've seen, you know, Figgy on the Anubarak. We know what he can do. It's more about with this compositionally, can Anubarak himself just hold up with those numbers? Because that spell armor and not being able to depend on that for this damage out of no tomorrow feels like it might be enough. Invade or at least scout here from Jin after Stukov secures their Giants. LFM see that pickup and they go, oh yeah, there's a couple of members behind that one. The Dahaka's already coming in and now Blaze, I don't know if he's going to be able to make the rotation, but you can see the pinch is here. Oh. There's going to be a big time stun. Drated coming in with the follow-up. Tomster lurking in the bush with that lurking arm and now we've got the Jet propulsion coming in Swabs. here by Swabs, locking them down. Making work happen on the back line. There's going to be the first kill. No, tomorrow is pulling away and ended up dropping three members in that trade. LFM, very thankful for the invitation of that inv of, of that invade and punished proper. Swabs rotation. You asked, you know, will he be able to make it down in time? I will question, you know, whether or not he would have been able to do so if Tomster had had better positioning with his original lurking arm. I would argue a lot of that fight was because he had such confident positioning and then got caught in the trub. But then other than that, I mean, his flank was great with a three-man jet propulsion cutting off the flank and throwing up double oil flame on the escape out. I mean, his damage was off the charts too. I really kind of wondered where we'd go into this Hanzo build. It looks like we are going to go into Redemption with the cooldown reduction on the Scattering Arrow. You go at four, get that extra damage onto minions, monsters, and of course the boss, and then maybe we'll get the cooldown reduction per auto and kind of really control a lot of the minions. Maybe make a play for those bosses. If you can get the rotation, because, I mean, in the future, right, it's 150% damage now. It's going to be nerfed to 100% in the near future on one of the upcoming balance patches, so... If you can get that race onto the boss quick enough, it, it's possible. It helps with the boss race, but it hurts in situations like this. Not yep. only with the anti-siege, because the AoE splash of the storm bullet four, four hits heroes and minions, even if they're stacked on top of the minion wave. Uh, the splash damage can go out and hit multiple targets, less clear, and just less minion control clear over it all in general. But again, as you said, the boss race is a very real victory there. You see Drayded very confidently taking the trade against Jay Srite there and able to dodge Jin's power slide. We've got ourselves first shrine phase. Whoever controls I has a huge advantage over that middle shrine. That'll be important for LFM if they want to contest. Time sensitivity between the two, not too heavy. Mid with only, what is it, about five shot advantage over that up top. You can see they're continuing. Now, if you look at the minimap, you can see Blaze rotating down. If there was going to be a play made by No Tomorrow, they could manipulate that, use that Brush Stalker, try and find a way to take advantage of that. Although I think right now, given the positioning of both teams, it seems like it's going to be a pretty neutral trade. But Equinox coming in, Dredd. Yeah, Equinox coming in, and now Aware is not going to be able to make it out of here. It's really just how much time can he buy. Casanova coming in with that warp. It's really just kind of the cherry on top. Able to now control I, make the flank up towards Figgy. I think he needs to find a way out of here. He's already pretty low. Jay Shrite, can he get the engage? Oh, he did get the channel. The channel counted. He did confirm. You can walk off of that thing with the last two shots and secure the channel as well. Again, the, the, the recognition on the side of No Tomorrow, although Figgy's still trying to find his way out. Here comes Casanova with the warp in. See if he can hit the Tom big Zer autos. Lurking. No, he's got friends here. Nice interrupt there onto the jet propulsion from Jin with that power slide. Now Jay Shrite is in a tough spot. But what I was saying, like the minute the blaze, the blaze was double soaking, mid bot, mid bot. And the minute he moved bottom, that shows so much. It's one of those opportunities where it's almost better to body soak in a bush instead of getting the clear, right? You don't necessarily have to clear. The minute you show that, you gave an opportunity for No Tomorrow to take advantage of that global. So it's always one of those things where it's like, all right, have you shown too much? And in that instance, they did.
No tomorrow. Winning when it comes to the rotation over the Battle of the Giants that we typically see between Shrine Phase 1 and 2 on Sky Temple. See if they can take out this front wall on top of it. The Lurking Arm deterrent from Tomster should be enough as Jay Shrite got into Worgen form for a moment, but ends up going back with that standard human form. That extra range on level 7, I'm like, where is Tomster? He's so far away. You get that extra range at level 7, he's way far back. You can see the position. Every time they've wanted to siege up on these on these walls with a camp, it's been to the lurking arm, being right at the front, daring anybody to step out. So structurally, things working out. But you know, we had a look a minute ago. Blaze versus Doc in that top lane was doing some work onto that top fort. ETZ is making their way up here as we're now 19 seconds out from the second shrine phase, spawning on top of bottom. Level 10 almost here for both teams. Those fireworks we talked about, Dreadnought, they might be coming into play real soon as Heroics are going to be locked in. The Cocoon, obviously, everything across the board. We are going to get Tranquility. That's a matter of if they're going into that one shot, one kill, are we going to get the X Strike, or will we see the Dragon Blade come out to try and sit on that back line? This is one of the games I feel like I'd like to see the X Strike. They're going to commit to the Dragon Blade instead, just for the survivability and the one shot capabilities. We talked about what the composition goals probably are going to be. Blaze has not made the rotation down. Equinox going to come in here. Figgy, no way to get the retreat, forcing out the cleanse and the dragon arrow attempt, I believe, there from T. I feel like Figgy cut his burrow charge off short yeah, there, There Treadnought. was a lot to talk about, actually. We may even take another look at that after this is all said and done. But hold up. Jet Propulsion lands, follow up there. There goes the Mosh Pit, going to land on top of two. Jay Shrite making work there in Worgen form with those auto attacks. Tomster is now going to get revealed from the cocoon. One member down. LFM still looking for a kill. Oh, Swabs, there's going to be the setup, and Draded instantly follows that up with a Swift Strike. That's going to help confirm one kill there onto ETC. Big time play there on the side of LFM. I did not think they were going to get there in time, but that communication and effort definitely worked out together. They're going to try and get some fort damage in before they go back to channel the remaining shots, get a little bit more value out of that bottom temple. I feel like that siege over that bottom section there, though it isn't going to gain a lot. I feel like that's a positive moment here of growth for LFM. It is a small taking advantage of understanding that you just won the fight hard enough that you can force your opponents to back. You didn't buy a lot of time, but you did buy at least 25% onto the fort. Back out, take a couple of shots, whittle away back at this, and now you've claimed yourself this fort before you know the 13 minute mark, not waiting for the shots, not waiting for anything later on. Equinox isn't waiting for anything as he comes in with the brush talk gonna drop that isolation Figgy can he make it out he is just silenced to death big time as that's gonna be tough to walk away from Equinox trying to set up the play as the isolation hit the follow-up from Tomster obviously is there some aggressive positioning they might be looking to try and capitalize on this see if they can get more there's gonna be the slide Power slide in, Swabs able to kite around the body blocks of Jin as the root goes down, Jet Propulsion number two. Jin falling very, very low. He actually get the passive from Thompson just to keep him alive. Drayden goes in. Jay Shrita is gonna get met here in the one versus one. There goes the Salvo, and they find themselves a blaze kill here. No Tomorrow fighting back. Turn of events here in favor of No Tomorrow. Now they'll turn their attention down, having the Grey Mane, having the Phoenix. You talk about sieging potential, getting into Worgen form if it's even necessary. Having this style of composition definitely going to rip through some of this damage. There's going to be a power slide directly onto Figgy one more time. He Again, a short burrow charge means he's looking for a fight, but the isolation is going to hit on him again. Yeah, it is interesting. You are right. Both of those times it's been used to get interrupted a little bit slow. Jin. Has got to be thankful for Tomster. Oh, wait a minute, though. Dragon's Arrow with the Dragon Blade. Can they get the reset one? There it is. Drated finding reset two onto Jin. Not going to pull the trigger on a third. Jay Shrite moving up, maybe out a bit too far. And the Cocoon from Figgy is going to confirm that one as a big yes. How yeah. long does the puppy last? <laughs> no Tomorrow walks away. And he's like, yes. Man. All right. Now with those three kills, you've got yourself a Hanzo with Scattering Arrow build at four and seven. Time to take a box. I really just feel like Figgy was showing how big his heart is. You know, he found a stray dog out in the streets of Sky Temple, and he's like, you know what? We're going to bring you home. We're going to we're gonna shelter you in. You know, looking for more was, in fact, doing exactly that. Looking for more doggos to save up on the streets. How do you shelter your dogs in cocoons? <laughs> you know, I, I it's, it's a blanket. It's and a Uberac's blanket. got a weird way to show love. I mean, I watched the Valentine's the skin with Zagara, right? <laughs> like, I mean... They're trying to figure it out. Shots being obtained now for LFM after that last victory and picking up the boss thanks to that Hanzo build we see. 
The Hawk up Rush Stalker bottom, which yeah. means they're trying to collapse onto the Blaze. We'll see if Blaze can get out of he here. He should be able to, but the Jet Propulsion Body Block is going to be real. Now he's definitely dead. Dragon Zero flank. They're going to get a collapse here. LFM is not giving up on swabs. Swabs made it out alive for the moment. Let's see if we can get any plays in return, but Stukov is going to be the first one down. The Cocoon's going to go on to Phoenix. No return damage on the side of No Tomorrow's. Jen's going to fall. See if they turn their attention back towards that Phoenix. As we see, oh. Equinox is going to go down on this side, and Phoenix the entire time. That is four members down, and now LFM can easily walk directly up to this keep and take that. Take it for free. And when they take this keep and end up getting it, look how many shots exist on the map. There's no way you can actually stop any of those from being consumed. Majority of the rest of those go in, and you're suddenly looking at what's going to be about a keep and a half with the 16 talent to your advantage. LFM has now put themselves in the Sky Temple circumstance where it is their game to lose. They are dominating over a majority of the situation here, not only in the experience, but again, in those structures, thanks to that siege of bottom lane. There's so much about this. Again, I talk about one of the perfect games. It's rare that you get a perfect game, so to speak, in terms of a lot of control from early all the way to the end. It's very rare that it happens, and I, I dare use the term perfect game, but there was the game on Sky Temple where LFM just, they had a, they had a leap in a similar fashion. They got so far ahead that they knew how to play. They were patient. It was, you kind of like, oh, well, I want the excitement. I want the big home run. But it's just kind of like, what if we just hit singles until we get to victory? And that's all that they did. And they just continued to work and whittle away the enemy team. And that's exactly what they're doing here. So much control, so much patience for such a young team. I think that's a really good way to put it. You know, just hitting singles until the game's done. You know, just doing your job. Getting the at-bat, going one for one. They, they might want to remember the temple's still active top, but they might be trying well, to get this and push all the way in. Yeah, this is one of those trying to be like, well, 16's a miles away. If we can get the siege beforehand, then we capture the shots, then we can amplify how much we're able to get out of this camp The minute itself. this shows, they all hard push that top lane. Yeah, there it is. There's the reveal, and Figgy's like, okay, time's up. Let's do this. Front wall going to be removed. I still would have liked to see a bit more passiveness over capturing those shots. That front wall could have died for free, and the shots could have secured this keep for free. Hold up, though. Punishment. As Swabs is still not to join in. Equinox has an upper hand here for a moment. Lands there. the drag. Blaze is coming down. The Salvo is going to be stunned out there. You can see the Cocoon already locked down. they got to be careful because ETC will have that mosh, but they got to be careful not to call him. Drita going in, trying to get the kill, trying to get the ball. Isolation. But the isolation has locked him out. Equinox got the bait with that tunneling claw and then was able to turn around with the isolation, forcing now the bunker onto swaps. There goes the lurking arm silence once more. Jin, does he go for the power slide? No. He ends up playing it safe here as you see Figgy waiting in that shrub, looking to make something happen there. Giants are still sieging towards the base of LFM. Rest of the shot's going to be picked up for LFM, or at least as much as no tomorrow let them, ha let, let them have. But still, when it's all said and done, this is still LFM in full control of this game, though the skirmish not so much in control. I said something about patience, and then they're like, nah, they're just gonna, I mean, there's a difference between going down, taking the wall, and then walking away. They stayed a little bit too long, overstepped their bounds. I think the biggest thing was that they showed themselves at a four-man up on the key front wall while somebody's getting the shots on top, which means No Tomorrow goes, wait a minute, you have all their members, but you don't have a five versus five clumped here. We know we can get the initiation and at least force what might be, you know, a temporarily advantageous fight for a fraction of a second there. But no tomorrow, or LFM, excuse me, only ended up losing one. Didn't lose too much when it came to shots onto the map itself. And now they're going to be just fine here. No tomorrow. Spending the downtime to claim this top fort for themselves. They have control over I as well, so nobody can make this rotation sneakily, as you see LFM trying to dodge it. Look at a new Brack. Oh my flank. They're going from a mile from downtown here. Here comes Figgy. Uh, he might oh, be he's a little He's like, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> He was so flank he was flanking so far. That it's was like, the where are you? Biggest flank I've ever that was super omega flank. And he it just was like of Zuna on Uther. It, it feels like <laughs> it, yeah. I will I will venture all the way around this map until I find you. That was a Hulkster level flank, actually. <laughs> that's what that's what I'm going with there. That was a Hulkster level flank. <laughs> We'll work on the Hulk analogies uh, in between games. No, sure, was, we weren't there yet. Not, not quite I thought there. I, I thought I nailed it. You know, I got the sports ball reference with the singles. I thought, you know, we might be able to carry <laughs> over to wrestling too, but apparently still something to be learned there. I mean, if he comes in and he slams them a little bit, now we're talking Hulkster levels. Yeah. 25 seconds out. So we'll see if uh, either one of these teams wants to kind of dish out the pain. 
I mean, for no tomorrow, it's almost like they have to force. It's almost 20, and they can't afford to just trade temples at this point. So no matter what, at the LFM, the shots, no matter what temple they take, will fire mid on the side of No Tomorrow, which I believe at this point in the game, unless they get two channels, just having one channel, their keep should remain. But again, it's a matter of playing around that 20, playing around that, so LFM can Stalker. easily just take one. On an island here. That's going to be Burrow time, and that's all she wrote. When he comes back out, he needs to live. Dragon's Arrow, the team, not going to be able to keep him alive. Nick Casanova now trying to get a little bit of damage out, but look at Drated there, getting reset one with the Dragon Blade. Looking for the second one, Casa using the warp over. Yes, he was discovered there. Drated, he's going to help try and confirm the kill. He's going to use some agility of his own. Casanova, though, he did go that lack of shield. Gives him mobility at level four, but it's not going to be enough to escape the clutches of Figgy and team. And now, just like that, we've got 20. We've got Hanzo on the boss, and there is no keep in this bot lane. Oh, man, this is a good math problem. If you screenshot this one, what's your win condition, LFM? The boss, the double shots, what do you do? They're going to know. It's the boss, and you just rush it in. I'm just saying, in the world of Pure League, everybody goes, what do we do, guys? There's so you many get, things. You go up and steal their night camp right now, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> take that their is, night camp and siege the front wall. That is the Hero League mentality. Here we go. You take the night camp, then go back and channel the temples. Yeah, there L we go. Yeah, LFM, though, they, they don't want any of those decision-making. I don't know what Hero League you've been playing, j Hal, but <laughs> LFM's got a different tone. They're going to make their way to the core. Drag on the Equinox. Bunker going to be dropped. A lot of damage. That's enough to not end this game. Losing Jin that early, or excuse me, losing uh, the member of LFM, Figgy, that early. Should have gotten got the camp. Should have gotten the camp, maybe. The shielding on the core is going to be lowered, 70 and counting, but there's not enough damage onto the boss itself, and that is GG. Just like that, LFM, after a crushing game number one loss, have come back in games two and three and really put their foot on the gas dreadnought because it's not just like they've come out and won. They have won decisively come around, like it's kind of I think it was right, right around the six minute mark in game number two here they take a big time team fight again and then they just steamroll and this is where LFM on Sky Temple when they get ahead outside a small little overstep in that top lane but when they get the lead on this battleground it is hard to come back against this team and that's why we always say this is probably LFM's best battleground by far yeah they look like a team that Honestly, LFM feels like when they hit 13s, if they feel like they're on even footing, they suddenly feel like, okay, we know how to play this game. Like, we're ready to go. It's just most of the time, when we get to that point, you know, they're down so much.